Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Lisa Lane joining us here once again, our expert parents, children, teenagers, listen up. She is a teen life coach. She is my teenlifecoach.com and she's helping families and children all around the world. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Please introduce yourself to us. She's look gorgeous today. I don't know if you guys are just on the radio side of things or if you're on the <laughs> Zoom, but you look great. It matches your whole um, a logo there. Oh, the, wow. The teal and blue. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. That was not intentional. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa Lane. Hi, everybody. And um, I am the founder and the CEO of MyTeenLifeCoach.com. I'm the faculty member of the Youth Coaching Institute, and I am a mom of three uh, teenagers and young adults as well. And what we do is um, we use evidence-based research to equip both teenagers and their parents to help the kids really become successful adults and get to their next stages in life and deal with some of the challenging things um, that, you know, don't necessarily require therapy, Mm -hmm. but, you know, needs to kind of work in order to get them to the next level. Fantastic. And at myteenlifecoach.com, where are you based out of specifically? We're based in Georgia. We serve the world. We have clients in Egypt, in Canada, Europe, and then all over the U.S. Great. And what did you have in mind for us today? I mean, you work with so many people. Last week in particular, we got to talk to my sister. Not everybody may know about that, but she has a teenager with special needs who's now going through puberty, and he has a learning uh, disability. He's got anxiety. He's got some issues, but we love him to death. His name's John Anthony. And um, so we did get to talk to them, and believe it or not, I spoke to my sister. Uh, I saw her uh, later that day or the day after, and we talked about it. Uh, oh. She, I don't think she's talked to John yet, but I want her to about talking to someone like yourself, whether it's you or not. Right. But my sister said you were just a, a sweetheart. You gave her a whole little bit of a different perspective to work on things. And I'm seeing my sister later, so I'm going to talk to her more about it because if you can elaborate kind of what happened and what you picked up as well. Yeah, well, what I what I realized is, you know, parents, they come from a particular perspective, and um, they come from the parent perspective of, you know, am I doing a good job? And it, it really is from their inside world outwards. And sometimes it just helps to put that aside and try to get into the shoes of whoever you have in your life that is an adolescent, and understand what it looks like from their perspective. Um, But also, you know, there's so much research and information out there right now that parents don't always know where to go find that. So we help facilitate that so that, you know, um, for example, I saw the light bulb go off um, with your sister when I said, you know, even though he has these challenges in his mind, he's also evaluating himself. You know, who am I? Who do I want to be in the world? What is comfortable for me? How do I want to deal with and talk about this so that I can have control over my life? And um, and they all have those thoughts, you know, no matter where they are on the spectrum or what their challenges are, we're all in humanity and we all have those basic needs. And actually, it was your session last week that made me really think about, you know, as extroverts, you and I are natural extroverts, otherwise we wouldn't be on Zoom and on the radio and stuff right now. But a lot of um, extroverts find it easy to have those social connections and especially when you are working with kids um, specifically and that's what I wanted to talk about today was uh, children who are introverted who have what we call SPS that's um, sensory processing sensitivity those are children that we call high, high sensitives and there are adults like that too and pretty new concepts so you know adults may not um, or parents may not always be aware of you know that this is a, an actual thing and then adolescents who are just naturally shy or have trust issues how do they make social connections yeah. so what I wanted to do was just share with parents there are five things and we can do like a quick quiz here if I were to say to you which one is more important, um, food and shelter or social connection? Yeah. Which one would you say? Um, well, food and shelter, clearly. Uh, social connection comes later, but 
I can yeah. different these days and people are going to say different things like what? <laughs> no that's right really? so yeah so it is on the third level of everybody knows Maslow's hierarchy um social connection is on that third level hierarchy okay so now let me ask you this one which one do you think is more important having a sense of competence and in con- being in control of your life or social mm-hmm. connection being in control of my life Okay, so the actual research shows that they're equally important. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. wow. So having a sense of competency and control is as important as having social connection. Okay, here's the third one. Um, do you think that a sense of belonging is a prerequisite for academic achievement? If what, or, what's a pre- what, I missed it. A, okay, so do you think that um, a sense of belonging or like oh, social connection? Of, got it. Mm-hmm. So do you think that social connection is as important as academic achievement or do you think it needs to happen before academic achievement? I'm going to say it's as important. All right. So it's actually a prerequisite. Ah. They, they say in, so in, in the research that having social connection or engagement um, in social belongingness is as important as um, academic achievement. So those two go together. Okay. All right. Then here's the last one. Um, do you think that social connection is more or less important than sleep? Less important than sleep. Sleep it's, is more important. It's as important. Whoa. Yeah, it's as important. And so, and then the last thing that they have found is that 50, it's a 50% insurance policy, 50%, 50% insurance policy against failing classes, being resilient, um, uh, having good self-esteem, confidence, and depression. So if you have good social connection, you have a 50% more likelihood of doing better in those areas. So now you think about, okay, for those who do not have enough social connection, what is actually happening to their bodies? So research shows that their actual gray matter in their brains start to decline. So the gray matter in your brain is about... Um, brain activity, like actual just brain, your brain working. And so your, your, your brain, the gray matter actually starts to decline for, for adolescents who are not socially connected enough. And also, besides, you know, obviously an uh, increased risk in eating disorders and suicidal de- ideation and depression and stuff like that, in adulthood, they have proven that it is on par with the mortality rate of smoking and obesity. Wow. So just to that just kind of gives us a sense of how critical it is for us to feel connected in some way, shape, or form. Now let's add on the layer of being an introvert. So introverts start out in the beginning of the day. Their battery pack is nice and full and charged. As they go on through the day and the more people they're connected with, their energy levels decline, 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 decline. So introverts already struggle with if there's too much social connection around me. So that's the one part. Then you've got the highly sensitive kids. So let me just explain a little bit about that. Um, So highly sensitive kids, are it's not a disorder. It's not a thing. It's just a personality trait. And if you imagine... Like, for example, if I go out to a concert or a show or a theater uh, thing, right, Um, I'll be sitting in the audience and I will be like looking at the lights and the set and and all of that stuff. And I'll just kind of feel the general feeling of the stuff around me. I can hear the people talking and all that stuff. So let's say I would be at a sensory level of like five out of ten, a highly sensitive person, they will feel the temperature of the air, who's whispering next to them, the actual vibes or the vibration of things around them. They will know much better, um, you know, if, if there's too much stimulation going on or too little stimulation going on, they feel and they, pro- they process awareness of their environment on a whole different level. So those individuals will pick up on things which could trigger other things. So now let's say you're a highly sensitive and you're introverted. It's going to make your battery pack go down even faster. 
if you are a shy person, a shy teenager, so already feeling awkward, already naturally worried, already naturally tense in social settings, and they have this deeper awareness of their environment through sensitivity, that's going to have an additional impact on them. And then you've got kids who have had maybe trauma, so they've got trust issues. So whether they've had bullying experiences, social rejection experiences, any kind of familial or friendship traumas, add that on to being a social, a, a sensitive person, that's going to add as well. So a lot of my clients and why I wanted to talk about it today is because I have a lot of parents calling me right now saying, I have a highly sensitive introverted kid and I am so worried about them not making friends at school. Yeah. And so now you've got parents and we were talking about enabling who are like forcing these kids to like be part of this and go to that and inviting people over and and like creating these forcing these social situations right so um i had a kid who um whose mom was called called me mom is an extrovert uh kid is an introvert um and literally has no friends uh-huh. had had one friend um who then um I guess something happened and, and, you know, that was no more. So mom is in tears and um, she is like, what is, what am I going to do with my kid? You know, why is it that he can't make friends? Why is he just wanting to be by himself, etc.? And um, there are probably a thousands upon thousands kids who are feeling exactly this, especially at the beginning of the school year, yeah. like going to their new grades and things like that. So, um, you know, I think about myself, I was probably the kid who was very shy and had trust issues. So I was still extroverted, though. And, you know, I I don't consider myself overly sensitive. Some people might disagree with me. But, um, but even, you know, me remembering myself as a teenager, like walking into a room full of people was a nightmare for me. Like I couldn't do it, even though I was a ballerina and stuff, put me on stage and switch off the lights and the audience and I yeah. could do what I needed to. But, you know, if I had to walk into a room full of people, it was, it was so anxiety provoking for me. So what we do is we teach, um, when I'm coaching these kiddos, I, I teach a concept called acceptance and commitment. Um, they call it training or therapy. Uh, there's different um, ways to kind of say it, but it's called ACT. And, um, and so what we do there is um, we help the teenager move from inflexible thinking. So the example of that would be that they get stuck in their belief system. I am an introvert. I can't do this. I don't like people. I don't want to do this. I don't know how to talk to strangers, so I'm not going to go. Yeah. Right. So those are those like that get stuck in that like uh, loop, I guess, mm-hmm. and we start to help them work through getting to a more flexible um, thinking state, and that is about you know, that you still have the ability to learn new things, that you can grow and adapt out of this loop of stuck thinkingness. And um, so I have a few tips that parents can write down today if they're listening to this. Um, And often, even with introverts, I'll tell you, Jill, like they don't want to be coached, right? Mm -hmm. Because what the heck, what are they going to do with me on a 45 minute call when they don't want to talk to anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So often, like I did with your sister last week, is you talk through the parent, right? You can coach the parent and and empower them to coach the the children or the teenagers. So here are a couple of tips that I I thought would be helpful for everybody today. Um, The first thing is, believe it or not, back to self-care and mindfulness, right? So mindfulness-based skills, it's it's about um, activating their safety responses. So um, kid goes into a room full of people, they, especially if they're sensitive, they're going to immediately start to feel their bodies. Like I can't breathe. I'm hyperventilating. My heart rate's going up, et cetera. Right. So it's about teaching them the skills of taking a breath, shaking it off, you know, like loosen up a little bit, open up your posture. So it's as simple as that kind of things. Yeah. I can see you. You're like, I'm like, Oh, I gotta yeah, move uh-huh. my body. <laughs> Um, So that's the first thing is just teaching them awareness that nobody's going to notice 
if they just stand up a little bit more. I have a trick that I teach kids like this. I say, if you're going to walk down the sixth grade hall, I want you to imagine that your body is um, eight inches bigger all the way around you and that nobody can enter that space. And so you are larger in your energy field. So when you're walking down the hallway, stick your earphones, even though, even though you're not allowed to play music, just put your earphones in your ears. It doesn't have to be attached to anything and create this breath of largeness so that when you are walking down that, that hallway, no one can touch you, right? Like I can't be touched. So I call it like, like I want you to bubble up, you know, leave the bathroom, get out of that toilet stall, bubble up and and make your energetic larger than life. So that's the first one. The second one is it's so important for us not to assume that we know what their insecurities and what's important to them. So for parents to just sit down and say, what's important to you around social connection? What do you want out of being connected with friends? Some kids might say, I only want one or two friends and I only want them to be friends with me in the gaming area or, you know, through what I'm doing Mm -hmm. after school or whatever. But how many times have we actually stopped to ask what's important to you as far as friendship and connection goes? One of the things that I also do with clients is I I do concentric circles of friendship with them. I'll say to them, all right, let's draw three circles and who is in the absolute middle circle? Who is the ones that you can tell your secrets to? Maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's a sibling, doesn't matter. You have that inner, like deep, deep circle with that person. Your second circle is, okay, I'm what would I not give them that I would give my first circle? And then your third circle are like acquaintances or people that you would not give what you would give your second circle of people. And that often allows them to get perspective of, okay, well, what's important for me around the the first circle, the second circle and the third circle, right? Um, So that's the second one. The third one is something I call a values guided action towards your goals. So um, for example, um, I want to make friends. Okay. What's it, what is, what is something that you won't negotiate on? Uh, well, I, I don't want to be around friends who are vaping. Yeah. Okay. That's a value, right? Uh, for some kids, it doesn't bother them. Right. Um, for some kids it does. Um, I, it's important to me that, um, if I tell them something, they're not going to go snitch and go tell the whole school about it. Yeah. Those are all like super important values. So, so making a list of values and, you know, just as a reminder, your values is what you truly believe in things that define part of who you are as a person. So not just clarifying what's important to you, but what are your beliefs, right? Do you even want to be around kids around a certain topic or a certain situation, right? Some kids, it's important for them. Like I want to have friends, but they have to be part of my um, spiritual community even, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Then here's an important one. This is number four, self-compassion to yourself, right? Um, they're so hard on themselves. There must be something wrong with me because I'm an introvert. There must be something wrong with me because I'm too sensitive. I have trust issues. So therefore, it's not, it's not possible for me to ever have friends. That self-compassion is so important from a mental health perspective because they're not special. Mm-hmm. There are millions and millions and millions of kids that are just like you, right? So along with the self-compassion then comes that self-trust. If I can't trust other people, I do know that I can trust myself. What can I trust about myself? Well, I know that if I get that icky feeling in my stomach and something doesn't feel right, I know that I can trust that. I know that if they are talking badly to me about somebody, there's a chance that they're going to talk badly, uh, that they're going to talk badly to others about me. So Uh, I can trust my intuition and myself that that's probably not somebody that I can feel comfortable with. So, um, you know, it's amazing how smart, how smart kids are when you actually sit down and you talk to them about what do you know you can trust about yourself? And then we start to build on that. So that's, that's, um, 
what was that, number five? So the last one is, actually there's three more, the, then the next one is um, social activities that involve physical activity. So introverts who are doing sports, yay. <laughs> Highly sensitive who are um, going to yoga or meditation circles or in um, some sort of uh, academic group, yes, that's great. Um, kids who are shy or who have trust issues, who um, are able to be in a theater activity or something where there's something physical going on and they um, are learning as part of the curriculum to do some trust related stuff. Yes, absolutely. So engage physical with the social activity, kind of combine those two together. So that's a that's a huge that's one that parents can feel like they have good control over. And then um, and then that constant self-reflection, Jill, um, you know, I talked about the self-trust and the self-compassion, but also like knowing that you, you are not mean or, or short or rude just because you speak in shorter sentences. Mm -hmm. Um, so the social skills on how to actually get people to understand who you are on a kid level or on an adult uh, adolescent level, often I will have these particular kind of kids. The parents will say to me, they do so well when they're with other adults. They have more adult friends than they do adolescent friends. Yes, because they know how to communicate. You know, it's easier for them to communicate at that level, but it's different to have to learn the teen language, like how do I communicate with my peers? And in those cases, often I'll say, okay, what can we apply from, yeah. you know, you work so well with adults. How can we apply that now to like what you do every day? Because there are kids who can relate to you on that level too. So those are like my tips for those kinds of things today. And, okay. um, and those are things that parents can help with, you know, it's not something you always have to go and buy, you know, coaching packages for or anything like that. Um, and of course, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of complication based on that. <laughs> of course, of course. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you for sharing that. And just curious, I mean, how has your week been? Could you share any experiences this week in particular with some clients without mentioning their names, but some things that maybe our listeners can resonate with? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, the pattern uh, between my high schoolers my, and my middle schoolers and college kids. Um, so the middle schoolers have higher anxiety in general. Um, I have um, experience with a client this week who had COVID and couldn't go to her first few days of school. So her anxiety levels were higher because she was worried about that um, fear of losing out thing, right? And um, that she would be like behind. So from a middle school perspective, it's so important for them to feel like they're getting that, that edge in because middle school is already so hard. Um, so in general, I would say parents can expect that, you know, the middle schoolers are gonna just generally feel higher anxiety as well as your freshmen in high school. Uh, freshmen in high school, they're excited because they're now with the big kids. Um, but they also feel like, you know, the very tiny fish in a very big pond. So um, most of my um, my anxiety moments is like they missed class. They couldn't find the class. They got lost and then they didn't know where to go, you know, and um, uh, scheduling, you know, some of the class schedules weren't figured out. So a lot of it was around the logistics, getting control over my environment and my logistics, like, you know, the whole social connection thing hasn't even entered their sphere yet and then and my college kids great excitement and happy to be back in a normal college year not COVID not half online that's gotta be not, different yeah you know just like lots of social activities going on and um like honestly when I see their faces on zoom I'm like oh my gosh where is the other person I've been working with like they're glowing they're so excited about stuff so um so yeah those are the, the kind of the trends um, with with that and then of course with the parents some of the parents that I'm working with just relief that they can start to take care of themselves again <laughs> now that the kids are back in school and kind of get back into that routine and the schedule um, so yeah that's kind of been the the trend 
Oh, well, it's a great trend that uh, things are getting back until we figure out what's happening now with the fall because they're saying it's going to be up again. But yeah, we've got through a lot the past two years, and I'm hoping we could uh, get through this, right? We will. Yeah, resiliency. I I, that, that's what I was going to say. Like the uh-huh. resilience is so much higher already. Um, and even when I'm looking at, um, you know, the school rules and stuff, it's like, no, you know, go get vaccinated, bring a mask, do whatever, but we're going to keep going. It's kind of what it feels like. Perfect. So. Um, now, I don't know if I could do this, uh, if it's okay with you. Could I just yeah. step away one second? Yes, of course. Because I might have a surprise. But- oh, my. Okay. <laughs> hey, John. I got John Anthony here. Hey, bud. It's so good to meet you. What a privilege. How is school today? I, I'm off for summer break. Oh, are you still on summer break? Yep, I'm going into high school next year. I know. I heard. Are you excited? Yes. So what is the thing you're looking forward to the most? What? What are you looking forward to the most? Meeting new students. Uh-huh. Yeah. Lots of new friends, right? Yep. And what's your favorite subject going to be, do you think? I want to do like earth science. Okay. Tell me why earth science. Because I like the space. Ah, I got you. Okay. Well, I'm really hoping that you and I will get to chat a little bit more sometime down the road. Okay. But good luck, okay? Thank I you. I hope it goes well. <laughs> All right. All right, tell her have a great day. Have a great day. Awesome. Take care, John. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, what a surprise, right? So, oh my gosh, you just made my day. I didn't so. know what time. I couldn't. I couldn't arrange it, but like I tried. So at least oh, I'm high. <laughs> I didn't want to you, say anything. You but, made my day because, like that face to the everything we talked about. It's like, oh my gosh. Oh, no, he's he's good. <laughs> he comes here sometimes and he helps me work and he likes talking to people. He likes operating the board and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Aww, I okay. love it. <laughs> go down, say bye. She can't see you. You gotta go. Yeah, so that's John, and I'm glad we got to do that. Thank you so much for letting. Oh me yes, <laughs> thank you. That was such a highlight. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you. If we want to reach out to you, myteenlifecoach.com. Yes. And we'll talk soon. All right. Take care of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you too. Have a great day. Bye bye, hun. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcasts on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's. It's going to be okay.